and welcome back, folks. This is the My Black Diabetes Meal Plan podcast. I'm joined once again by Dr. Joel Furman, and today we want to cover food myths. Why? Because every single, more and more every single day and every single week, uh, I keep getting more comments from you all that saying and suggesting that the foods you've been taught to see as being meaningful foods really aren't. And it's appropriate, I believe, for, for Dr. Furman, who's actually made a career out of busting these food myths wide open to share with you today uh, exactly why some of the things that we believe are staples in our diets kind of don't belong in the first place. So Dr. Furman, I thank you once again for, for joining. My pleasure. Uh, Doc, if you have diabetes, um, you're looking for food substitutes all the time. And there's a lot of different groups that are all about helping uh, people with diabetes find new substitutes, new low sugar cookies, new low sugar crackers, new low sugar this, that. Um, but what's interesting is that you actually have a quote in your book, uh, The End of diabetes, it's just fantastic, by the way. You have a quote that says, the whiter the bread, the sooner you're dead. Now, most people have heard something like that before, but you go further, you say that sugar-free cookies, the cakes, the pastries, they're sugar-free. A lot of the things that people with diabetes are eating as substitutes for the real thing are actually dangerous for us. Why is that? Well, a lot of reasons. Number one, um, white flour is the same as sugar. So if, it's, so if you're eating a pizza or pasta or white bread, there's no difference between eating that and eating a cube of sugar or candy because the body converts it right into sugar, enters the bloodstream as sugar. So there's no biological differences from eating sugar and eating white bread. Wow. So white bread is poisonous. And I'm saying that it's so poisonous that it even raises risk of heart disease and stroke more than eating meat does. As bad as meat is, eating white bread and pizza is more lifespan shortening. They do some studies to show meat isn't so bad when they compare it to white bread. But it doesn't mean meat's not bad. It just means when you compare it to white bread, white bread's <laughs> even worse. You know what I mean? But the, but the point is, of course, that um, when you grind flour into, when you grind wheat into flour, you're you're increasing its glycemic effect radically. The glycemic load means the amount of sugar that goes into the bloodstream right after you eat the food immediately. And the rush of sugar into the bloodstream stimulates appetite centers in the central nervous system, in the hypothalamus, and also stimulates dopamine release in the brain. So you become dopamine insensitive, requiring more sugar and more sweets for the brain's um, benefit. So it makes you desirous now of more sweet. So when you eat white bread, whether it's sugar sweetened or not, it's the same as eating sugar. And then if they add a low, if you're eating something with a low calorie sweetener in it or a non-calorie sweetener, it still stimulates the brain's desire to want more sweets. So even though you're, you're drinking a, a sugar-free soda or a sugar-free cracker or a cookie, and even if it's made with oats and, and like stevia or xylitol or sorbitol or some other low zero calorie sweetener, the brain and the tongue still sends neurological signals to the body continuing and, and promoting your, your addiction to sweets. So you're not having sugar right then, but you desire more sugar and more ca calories another time, an hour later or two hours later. It keeps you desirous of more calories. When you keep stimulating appetite centers and dopamine receptors in the brain with these concentrated calories and artificial stimulating substances, it makes you into a calorie consuming monster. Also, that's two, that's two or three reasons, but then also you're consuming calories with no significant micronutrient load. They're just empty calories. And when you're processing and metabolizing calories, you're wasting nutrients and antioxidants and vitamins and minerals. So you're stripping into your body's nutritional reserves in the process of trying to metabolize or assimilate those calories and turn them into energy or fat on your body. And for, so, you're, so you're becoming more malnourished and more inflamed and you're aging faster with every bagel and piece of white and Italian bread you eat. 
You'll be aging yourself and creating more diabetes, more weight gain, and more aging your body because inflammation is the foundation of cancer and autoimmune conditions and infections and deaths from COVID. So the more you strip your body of the antioxidants when you eat those foods. And lastly, of course, maybe they're, because they're, they drive up insulin, right? They drive insulin. Insulin is a fat storage hormone that also promotes cancer because it, because it revs up angiogenesis, mm. which is the growth of blood vessels to fuel the fat supply. So now it allows cells to proliferate and replicate that shouldn't be growing. When you're eating growth promoting foods like pizza and hamburgers, we're talking about the combination between high protein animal products with high glycemic carbohydrates. That's the perfect witch's cauldron for cellular replication and growth because you're driving growth by two different mechanisms. You're driving fat growth on your body, but when you drive fat growth in your body, you're driving other cells to grow besides fat that shouldn't be growing like cancer cells and tumors. So you're really setting the stage for a premature death and wiping out your telomeres and your stem cells and just and shortening your lifespan. So the American diet, I always say, it's, it's been designed, I said on, on PBS television on, an, on a filming, I said, it's been designed by Al Qaeda to kill oh, everybody. That's right, I remember American that. Diet. And then they cut me, they dubbed that out and they cut out the word Al Qaeda on television. And they put, it's been designed by Darth Vader to kill everybody. Oh. They dubbed somebody <laughs> word saying Darth Vader. I guess it wasn't politically correct or something. So they, so it made my good joke into a really stupid joke because Darth Vader is not funny. Al Qaeda, anyway, whatever. Yeah. We're, I'm we're, just making sure people don't blame me for that bad joke with okay. the Darth Vader. I know that was my joke. <laughs> right, you gotta <laughs> cover your tracks. The the uh, but you know one thing I love about when you speak, you give a continent of knowledge within you know about a minute and a half. And so I just want to go back really quickly. Um, this isn't even on my questions list. Um, but one thing you just said was that hey, if you're eating these foods, you're eating, you're ingesting these processed foods. Well, guess what? It takes nutrients. It takes energy to actually deal with and process that processed foods once it enters the body. In other mm -hmm. words, in order to digest that food, you have to use already existing quality nutrients that are inside your body that should be going to running your brain, running your heart, running your organs, helping you feel good. But now you're recruiting those in order to deal with this, with this unnatural food that you just put into your body. Am I getting that correct? That's correct. The so your body is storing nutrients and we're saying the American diet is grossly nutritionally deficient, especially in antioxidants and phytochemicals. And with every bite of foods that do not contain a significant micronutrient load, you're stripping the load you already have in your body, making your deficiencies go even worse. Mm. And those antioxidant and phytochemical deficiencies lead to chronic inflammation which is one of the causes of heart disease and cancer, premature aging, kidney failure, blindness. You know, we're talking here about the, all the damage from diabetes is the buildup of reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products and other toxins and inflammatory substances that build up because of the lack of nutrient of these antioxidant nutrients. And we're saying the, you get further down the road of to, to, a, to disease and death when you keep eating processed foods that don't contain nutrients. And by the way, what you're saying, the brain is a giant utilizer of antioxidants and the brain requires a constant exposure to phytochemicals and antioxidants, lest you lose brain cells and you're, you get, lose your memory, you lose your intelligence, and you're more prone to depression, right. and you eventually become demented, They're just a real shadow of yourself. And there's, you know, so you, you lose who you are because your brain isn't getting the nutrients it needs to maintain its cellular integrity. These are part, folks, of the food myths that we were talking about. You, this idea that um, there are substitutes for these natural foods. When you're grabbing onto that, that new sugarless cookie that's coming out, what you're really doing is saying, your body's really saying, look, I want some, I want some sugar, but more importantly, I want, some, I want a quality carb. And yes, we know that that fruit can often be the substitute that you're looking for. Um, but but I, I just wanna continue here because this, this goes even deeper. Um, you even say that eating processed foods is like snorting cocaine. Um, and that the more a person eats, their cravings actually become stronger. 
what do these foods have in them that is responsible for increasing these cravings? Um, many things, but one thing we're talking about here is the caloric rush into the bloodstream. Because in medical terminology, we call that a bolus. Because you could take something like an IV drip, a little drip every minute coming in slowly, or a doctor come in with a needle and shoot it into your arm with a bolus of one quick shot. And when you eat these processed foods, we're calling them fast foods, not just because you can open the bag or open the wrapper and eat them fast or buy them in a fast food restaurant or a, or a convenience store, but also because they're digested and absorbed very rapidly. And the speed at which the calories into the bloodstream, you can throw 100 calories into the bloodstream in five minutes. And this rush of calories into the bloodstream is very unnatural. If you're eating real fresh fruit or nuts or berries or, or greens or something in the, you know, you, the calories would come in very slowly and maybe one or two calories a minute, but now a hundred calories a minute or something like that coming in. And the brain is affected by that rush of calories and the brain gets a stimulatory effect in the same brain areas, regions and receptors as if you had snorted cocaine or taken heroin or taken a narcotic because the same dopamine receptors are stimulated. And just like at, over time, as you take in narcotics, the narcotics have less effect on you and right. you need more narcotics to get pain relief and more narcotics to let, not to get withdrawal and pain from the not having narcotics. The same thing is true with food. As you continue to take in all these such calories that are absorbed so rapidly, it makes the brain dopamine insensitive and start to, and the brain no longer feels normal unless it has an excess exposure to calories it's like you're, you have to get the cocaine, you have to get the sm smoke or cigarette on field, and you have to get those extra calories. You got to get those French fries in or drink that soda or have that bagel or have that cake or have that, you know, and I call the American diet the cake diet because people eat cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Because, oh, you know, you <laughs> pizza is cake. It's just because white flour is cake. It's just cake with some cheese on it. But burger is cake. It's just cake with a piece of meat between it. The fried uh, flour is the same as cake. <laughs> What's the breakfast, the cold breakfast cereals, the puff cereals and stuff? Right. And what about a muffin? It's just cake without the icing. And then they have for dinner, they have pasta, which is cake that they boil. It's just, it's all, or they, then they have real cake or they have a pancake, which is really, which is a fried cake. And then you pour sugar and syrup on top of the cake. I mean, it's almost disgusting. Right. And then they're not going to get, they're going to be not, it's amazing. They're not dead by 30 or 40 years old. Some people live to be 50 or 60. You know, the average, it, it's funny that, eating these foods, you know, people are, are actually passing away, you know, between 50 and 65, they're dying when the average lifespan should be between 95 and, 95 and 105 or 90 and 110 is where we, we really should be. We have the natural ability to live to be 95 to 105 in great health and people are losing 40 years of life and in America, we have the worst healthy life expectancy scores of most any other um, Western country. And in the world today, the only three there's only three countries that have a declining healthy life expectancy, which means it's going down. And that means how long you're living in good health and you can enjoy your life for. In America, the average, the life expectancy, healthy life expectancy score is 66.1 years. Mm. That's all we, then, then your health deteriorates and life is, a, is living hell, after, you know. When other countries, it's 75, 80, 85, and I'm saying it should be 95, not 66. You know, we're, we're killing ourselves with the foods we're eating. Right, right. I mean, you, there's, again, there's a lot of pieces that you were able to, to touch on. It's like that rush of sugar that we're um, bringing into the body creates a habit of craving for other, other types of sugar. You know, we know that sugar overworks the pancreas but it does more. When we eat high amounts of sugar without micronutrients, you're saying that we're also creating metabolic havoc in ourselves through, uh, in, in your book, you call them toxic metabolites. What are toxic metabolites and how does metabolic, happen, metabolic havoc happen when we actually consume and eat those processed foods? What's going on in the cell the moment that we decide to choose that, that the cake diet, the pancakes, the burger cake, the, the muffin cake. Right. Well, you set up a whole system of um, hormonal receptors that are activated. 
like we're talking about ins insulin is the primary hormone, but when you take in sugar, it also raises IGF-1, which is insulin-like growth factor one, another growth hormone that of course promotes cellular replication in cancer. But you're also, um, as we said before, you're activating acrylamides, which are um, glucose is binding to cell surfaces and cellular structures inside the cells. And we call those things advanced glycation end products. We abbreviate them as AGEs, advanced glycation end products. And most scientists think that the buildup of advanced glycation end products, and by the way, the advanced glycation end products build up because of the extra glucose, but also because of the acrylamides we consume from eating um, baked and hardened and cooked substances like the crusts of breads, cold cereals, you know, baked, things that are baked, browned, toasted, um, dry. We get acrylamides from the external environment. The body absorbs them as advanced glycation end products, build up in the cells, the high glucose builds up advanced glycation end products. It comes from, so the AGEs build up from multiple sources. Yes. And most scientists think that when a diabetic becomes blind or goes into kidney failure or nerve damage, it's really the buildup of the, of the advanced glycation end products that cause the diabetic retinopathy or the kidney failure in conjunction with the buildup of reactive oxygen species, mm. which, is a, which is a major form of free radical that age us prematurely. We were talking earlier today about the more inflammation, free radicals are the primary toxin that creates the inflammation. It's, the, it's oxygen losing its last electron because the healthy diet bathes us with antioxidants all the time and keeps the oxygen molecules in compounds from becoming oxidized. So that's, they can't um, cause havoc and destroy tissue and age and destroy cell function and structure. So we're saying here, there's a lot of um, biochemistry going on, unfavorable biochemistry that creates disease from the buildup of these toxins. And I'm just mentioning those two toxins. I mentioned right. just two. The two most important ones are reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products. But there are other toxins like lipofusion and aldehydes and, and um, ammonia and uric acid and urea. And we could, we could keep listing different toxins, but those are the two primary ones. Right. Right. And <clears throat> so if I'm, if I'm getting this straight, <laughs> not only do we increase that level of toxicity, but it also seems to stand that we get fatter too. And from your work, is it, am I wrong in saying that the fat actually deactivates the, uh, it deactivates insulin response inside the body and raises blood sugar as a result? Correct. <clears throat> We're getting both of those. That's a two for one uh, just by choosing the processed food. Is that correct? That's right. You know, it's so in this society because everybody's so fat that they people try to de-emphasize the dangers of fat on the body. Fat on the body is really tremendously lifespan shortening, depression causing, you know, we're taught cancer causing. Fat is dangerous on your body because fat cells, like you just said, make you insulin resistant which means they block the use, the utilization and function of insulin. So the beta cells now have to produce in the pancreas have to produce higher levels of insulin because the insulin's not working. So the body keeps producing more and more. And the more insulin you have, the more angiogenesis, the more cancer promoting effects, the more effects, negative effects on your heart. Excess insulin is the, is really a, a tremendous danger and risk. And, fa and then fat cells not only raise extra insulin, because fat cells are naturally hypoxic tissue. They don't get a good oxygen supply. Mm. So they are a source of free radicals of reactive oxygen species and toxins. And there's also lipokines and cytokines and other inflammatory substances being dumped out of the fat supply. So the fat supply becomes a garbage depot that spews out waste products at a higher level than the rest of your body. It's dumping waste into the rest of your body, making you sick. Your fat makes you sick. It's not just inert tissue, it's living tissue right. that, that throws out waste at a higher rate. And so, we're, and then because of that waste, it also activates other hormones like estrogen to raise, increasing the risk of breast and prostate cancer and making men more feminine at the same time. Mm. So fat cells change your estrogen testosterone ratio in a male, they raise your estrogen and lower your testosterone. So now you don't just have impotence, you also have a whole bunch of problems going on. You know, right. And, and so we're, we're trying to keep our, what's the word, 
muscle to fat ratio favorable. So our estrogen testosterone ratio was favorable. Right. You follow me? Yes. Yes. The, the idea that fat is a, is a living tissue. I mean, I almost imagine it. If you can imagine the fat on your body, the excess fat, we all need a little bit, but the, the excess fat is pumping. It's a, it's a daily source of toxicity for you. It's, I mean, it's pumping these different toxins right inside. It's right. fuming. And so the idea is uh, we want to make sure that we're doing something about it because it is throwing our hormones, hormones out of, out of balance. And, and that's why we see so much COVID death in overweight people. Mm. And we're seeing COVID deaths, even people that aren't that old, because it's a combination of bad health, poor immune function, and overweight and inflammation that makes you susceptible to the morbidity and mortality from these infections. I'm saying, who's talking about this? And why are so many people dying for the simple virus? Because they have so much inflammation in their body and they cause, it creates a whole inflammatory storm of inflammation when they get exposed to these viruses when they eat poorly and are overweight and putting the wrong foods in their body. And nobody's discussing this. And we're seeing millions of people die needlessly. So this is a, in your, in your mind, this is almost like this is a public health concern. I mean, imagine if, imagine if um, the federal government powers that be uh, were to rearrange the standard American diet into a nutritarian diet. And we've just been raised with this. Do you, do you believe that, that uh, the societies that have now been affected by COVID uh, would have seen a dramatic decline? Not even, uh, they wouldn't have seen the spikes in deaths had no. people been eating since birth on a nutritarian diet. Right, almost nothing, almost no deaths except for the super elderly or immunosuppressed. There would be almost you no know, deaths, it's, it's crazy. You know, if I was up there, people were listening to me, I'd say across America right now, I want everybody to do this. Right now, eat a big salad for lunch, not a size of a soup bowl, but the size mm -hmm. of a serving bowl with vegetable, with cut up lettuce and something cruciferous like collard greens or mustard greens or turnip greens or kale or arugula. Put some, put some onion in there, onion or scallion in there, make a nut and seed based dressing and then chew that up really well and have a bowl of vegetable bean soup with mushrooms in there and a piece mm. of fruit for dessert. Okay, so now if everybody in the country started eating this big veg meal every lunch with a big chewed salad really well and a soup made with vegetable juices and onions and mushrooms and greens and, and beans, and a we would see COVID deaths drop down by like three quarters to eight, like 70 wow. to 80% right away. We'd stop all these deaths from happening. It wow. would just be amazing. And, but nobody's talks about stuff like this. It's just completely um, of no interest to anybody because it's not wow. like socially acceptable to tell people to eat healthfully. Right. <laughs> right. But say, <laughs> folks, if you're in the group, that's your lunch today. Okay. We're doing a very large salad. Uh, very large salad with the cruciferous vegetables, with the onions. Notice that Dr. Furman said to chew up very finely, take the time to actually chew. When you do that, you're releasing a lot of the uh, micronutrients, a lot of the phytochemicals into the body. I'll let Dr. Furman explain. What's the, what's the importance of actually taking the time to chew um, vegetables down, particularly our raw plant foods, when we mm -hmm. are sitting at a meal? Definitely. And you know, some of those nutrients you're releasing are anti-fat storage and they help the body burn fat and don't you store fat. But the enzyme we're talking about in green vegetables is called myrosinase, M-Y-R-O-S-I-N-A-S-E, myrosinase. It's heat sensitive. So it's destroyed with cooking. It's in a little packet in the wall of the cell. And when you're chewing really well, you break open the packet and the enzyme catalyzes a reaction to form the ITCs, the isothiocyanates, yes, which yes. are the most powerful anti-cancer substance in vegetables. So the more you chew, the more anti-cancer phytochemicals are formed in your mouth as you're chewing. And when people don't chew very well and swallow them whole, they're missing 90% of the value, the anti-cancer value of the food. The same thing is true while you put the onion and scallion on there because the onion and scallion have an enzyme called allianase, A-L-L-I-I-N-A-S-E. The only word with two L's and two I's right after each other. You get triple points in Scrabble for that. No. <laughs> Alli allianase. But that's another heat sensitive enzyme that we want to chew down. We want to put the scallion and onion, red onion on the salad and chew it really well and liquefy everything. This is magical. This magic's happening in your mouth because you're forming powerful trisulfides and disulfides, organosulfide compounds that have powerful anti-cancer effects. I'm teaching people now the way not to get cancer, not to get COVID, not to get 
serious illnesses by eating the, getting these nutrients to form in your diet and in your mouth, that we are in control of our health destiny. We have the power to protect our body if you put in the right ingredients into your body. Right, right. And, and folks, you know, sometimes will we'll ask, well, how come I'm, I'm already eating vegetables that are cooked? Why do I need the raw salad? I'm like, no, we need to go ahead and put both in there because they're doing, they're introducing to the body new solutions, solutions that are not just protecting you from diabetes. That's just the first piece. But what about, what about cancers? What about breast cancer? What about making sure you have hormonal balance? What Dr. Furman is suggesting for your day is that uh, the right foods are going to keep your body in its natural alignment. I've got to continue here. Uh, I know we're almost out of time. I can't believe this. Um, you didn't so get to your questions. No, no, <laughs> gosh, I have, I have really one question, which is about, um, I got someone this week and I'm getting more folks who are saying, look, I need to have some meat. Give me something. Um, now, I don't have a problem with some meat, so we'll add it in. Um, but what kinds of problems can multiple servings of fish, eggs, red meat per week cause diabetics specifically? Yeah, they're, they're linked to worsening the diabetes because, because of the growth hormone effects of all the high protein. It revs up IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor one. And we want the IGF-1 to be in that 120, you know, 100 to 160 range. Most Americans have the IGF-1 above 200. And you're not going to be able to control your diabetes when your IGF-1 is so high. Don't forget IGF-1, it binds to the insulin receptor and stimulates it just like insulin does, promoting fat storage and muscle growth, I mean, and tissue growth. You know, so it's a growth promoting hormone. Wow. So, so meats and animal products are too growth promoting. We wanna switch the animal protein into plant protein foods, more nuts, more beans, more greens, more, you know, and get rid of the, and get the animal protein down. We usually try to hold it below 5%, which means just a couple of ounces a few times a week, like a condiment. If people wanna make a bean burg a burger and get a little meat flavor, they can put like one ounce of meat into eight, eight ounces of beans and oats mm -hmm. and mushrooms and make it taste like a meat burger. They can make a chili and they could freeze a, a block of tofu and crumble it and it comes out like, um, like chewy chopped meat or put tempeh in there and just put a little meat in the, in the tofu, in the chili mix with all the beans. So you get, you're using the meat as a flavoring device wow. to make it taste meaty, but you're not eating that much meat. Right. So I would say like measure out their amount they're eating of those foods and use them as a flavoring. Like, you know, in years ago, people couldn't afford to eat meat and chicken and they were just too expensive and they would eat mostly things they could grow and, and vegetables and beans. And they would use a little bit. One chicken would be for the whole family of six for the whole month. They would use wow. one chicken for the whole month and they would flavor it out into a little piece for in, this, in a soup here and there to make a flavoring with it. So, you know, and you get the full flavor of that without having to use too much of it for those people who are missing that. Yeah. And, and Doc, we, we talked um, a, a lot today about a lot of different problems. The final, final question is, you know, leaving people with this, what does a nutritarian diet like my Black Diabetes meal plan actually offer so that people aren't facing these problems, they're getting pulled out of these problems? It offers a life-saving, life-changing um, opportunity, a real blessing for people that they don't have to have their life be fooled by tragedy, blindness, dementia, amputations, and suffering and death. In other words, this is serious business. You have to be insane to eat like other Americans eat. And if you're not insane or really ignorant, it makes you ignorant and insane with time because the foods destroy your brain. And now you just become a robot living life in the dysthymic condition, which means you're not that happy, not that excited about life, you've lost your creativity, you've lost your passion, and you're just living to suffer and to maybe go after some addictive substance like alcohol or food or addictive foods, and you're, you're living for your addiction, it's no real life. This is an incredible opportunity where people can create a much happier and healthier life for themselves. This idea that they think that they're gonna give up pleasure of eating and they're enjoying those foods, those are the primitive addiction talking. When you, healthy foods taste just as good and they taste better when you get used to, you learn the recipes and they taste incredibly and your taste buds improve and you like what you get used to eating and then you're in great health. In the, so there's no ultimate loss of pleasure in eating. It's just a temporary dip in pleasure until you get your health back and your taste comes back and you've learned and you have the learning curve. So that it's called a no brainer. It's just really, it's just the food. What makes this difficult to so, for so many people Either it's, they're not socially supported in their community, which is what you're doing for people and getting them on a, getting connected to do this together. 
and they're not given the tools they need, and they don't realize how addicting those foods have been pulling them and their neighbors back to eating that bad way. And they got to collectively stop that. They've got to collectively work together to win the war against the, this thing that's, that's ravaging some of our communities and killing people. And as you know, some of the communities of color in the, they're getting worse. They're getting worse COVID. They're getting more diabetes, more amputations. It's all about food exposure. And that's a form of bigotry there too, because you're stuck without access to good food. And then the good food creates a vicious cycle of reduced opportunities in life. You know what I mean? Exactly. Dr. And it's almost like, it's, it's always, I wrote this in my book, Fast Food Genocide. I was taught that, um, that black Americans, even in medical school, we're taught that they have, that they're somewhat genetically inferior, more prone to diabetes, more prone to prostate cancer, more prone to, you know, kidney. That's not true. There, I went back and showed um, the data that after the Civil War, Black Americans lived longer than most 100-year-old people, the most centenarians. Bit, it's not, there's no defect in pre, their susceptibility to disease. Any population gets exposed to those dangerous foods has the same outcomes. I showed that with comparisons to Southern Caucasians exposed to bad diets had just as bad outcomes. There's nothing genetically weaker about a person with darker skin, more prone to diseases. That's not true. You, you, could, be, you could have incredible superior health and you just got to take it and earn it through putting what, what you put in your mouth. Dr. Furman, I cannot thank you enough for, for joining us today. I look forward to another conversation yet again. So much wisdom, folks. Um, links for to follow Dr. Furman are going to be in the description here. Uh, thanks once again for joining the My Black Diabetes Meal Plan. Uh, and if you are in need of a meal plan, check out myblackdiabetesmealplan.com. This is where we are able to help you through what many of the problems that we've been talking through today. So Dr. Furman, thanks so much and be well and we'll see you next time. Okay, see you later. Bye-bye.